Hey everyone and welcome back to another Unreal C++ tutorial and today's topic we'll be looking at adding impulse to physics actors. So by the end of the video you should have something which will be able to do this and all that's happening here is the component is constantly rotating in the middle there. It's tracing out into the world a certain distance, finding if it's found a physics actor and then if it has it's applying an impulse to it. So we can just see that I have my scene component attached to the BP underscore add impulse blueprint. This is just a component which I've named apply impulse and all it's doing is it's tracing out a certain distance and applying a certain force or impulse force when it finds a valid actor. Just to answer a few questions as well the difference between impulse and force here. Impulse I think is technically a type of force but forces are calculated differently in Unreal. So impulses you'll use in instances like this where you're adding a single impulse or kind of pushing something back just once like I'm doing here so that would be the result of some kind of feedback from being shot or when you're shooting an object in the world whereas force is applied constantly over time usually used for things like rockets and thrusters to keep uh, a kind of momentum being built over time from that thruster so we will be looking at apply force in the future topics as well but just to answer any of the questions why some of the terms used interchangeably is I think impulse is kind of classed as a, like I said a type of force but is used slightly differently in the context here being just a single fire effect. So the way that I have this set up, the reason I'm in the components folder here, what I've done is created a component named apply impulse component. This is a scene component similar to the previous topics if you've been watching those. So that I could attach this to a bigger blueprint actor just to make it again slightly more reusable. So what you might want to do is create a component like this and attach it to the end of a rifle or a gun or something or whatever's going to be providing some impulse. You could of course just drop this straight into your character or weapon class depending on what you're looking for but the main thing is we'll see by the end of this video how to trace forward, find something and apply impulse to it. Okay so over in the IDE and again just because people seem interested in this I'm using JetBrains Rider for Unreal and you can find this on the marketplace currently it's free it will be paid I think sometime next year. Inside of my scene component so again using the using component here so I've removed a few things I've gotten rid of the begin play the second public section and I've created a private section where I'm just storing two float variables uh, the trace distance and the impulse force. I've provided both of these a default variable so that they're immediately uh, initialized with a value and I've provided both of these the same U property, which is of edit anywhere so that we can change this anywhere like I've just shown in the editor and I've dropped them in a category named force variables. So that's all that we need to do in the header file. Over in the code file, of course, if you followed along exactly, you want to remove the begin play here and I'm running all of my logic in the event tick. So you don't have to do it this way, probably recommended not to, but I just wanted to get that visualization of the constant impulse is being added to different objects and that's why I've just added a rotating component. But in here, what we're going to do, we're going to go through step by step and start getting all of the parameters that we'll need for our line trace event in a moment. So if you've watched any of my other C++ topics, if you've seen the line tracing or the ray, also known as ray tracing topics, then I'm using some of the code from there for the line trace single by channel. So we're using the get world function here. So the first variable that we need is an f hit result, which I've named Hit. We then want a start and an end point and of course these are locations so they're going to be f vectors. So I have the first one which is a constant f vector named start which is simply the get component location so that's the location of the component in the world and then the end location so an f vector end. This one can't be set as constant because this will be based on some variables being uh, checked against here. So the end is going to be equal to our start location plus the get component rotation, because remember I've got this rotating constantly, uh, to a vector multiplied by the trace distance. So that's why we're using the trace distance. So that's going to go that distance into the world from the start location. So we've got our start, our end, and a hit result. The final thing that we're going to need to pass in that we can store is the F collision query params. I've just called this one trace params. We don't need to set anything specifically here, but again, uh, I go into a little bit more detail on this in the line trace topics if you wanted to check those out. To use all of these then, we're going to create a new boolean named bhit, and this will be equal to the get world. Remember I said we're using this in the get world context, not the kismet context. And from this, we can call the function line trace single by channel. So this is just going to do a single line trace. 
and we'll be setting the channel in just a moment. But first of all, we're going to pass in our hit result, then our start and our end, all separated by commas. So this is where the line will be tracing from and finishing. Then the channel, uh, the trace channel here, I'm just going to use the ECC underscore visibility. The other option by default would be the camera, uh, but I tend to just trace on the visibility channel to leave the camera channel free for all of the camera specific stuff. And then finally, we can pass in our trace params. Like I said, we don't need to override anything here. We just need to have that provided. We can close that off and that is our line trace done. Then when we have our line trace, I have a chunk of code down here. And what we're going to do is we're going to see if our B hit is, uh, is valid. So if we've hit something, so when you've done this line trace, it will return whether or not it's found something in the world that it has traced against. So if that's true, I've drawn a debug line. Uh, this is going to be uh, needing a reference to the world, so get world. And I've used the same start and end position. So the visualization for the line is going to be exactly the same place as the line trace was. And this is just because we don't have any debugging or visualization functionalities from the world specific line traces. Again, if you wanted to see more on the Kismet stuff, which does provide this, I've got some Kismet line tracing topics in the playlist as well. And one thing to note here as well, which is going to be really important because we're using the draw debug line, we also just need to go up and in the include section, just ensure that we are using the include draw debug helpers dot H. Without that, we're not gonna be able to use any of the draw debug functions such as the line here, or if you wanted to do things like drawing debug shapes. Uh, next though, I've given this line a color of orange so that again, this will just stand out very nicely. I've set the variable B persistent lines to false so that this doesn't stay on screen forever. And I've given it a very short lifetime of 0.1F, so 0.1 of a second, which is just how long this will draw to the screen. Now the important things down here, this is where the actual checking and applying of impulses will be handled. So the first thing we want to do is we now know that we have a valid line trace result, so we've hit something. So what we're gonna do is create a new pointer to a U static mesh component, and I'll name this one mesh component. We want to cast this to the U static mesh component to make sure it is of that type. And then we want to get our hit, so our hit result that we've stored a bit earlier, the F hit result above. We want to use the get actor function and then the get root component on here. So we're gonna check that the root component is a U static mesh component. Then below this, we're going to say if mesh component, so if that has been filled, so we find a valid mesh component, and the hit, again, using the get actor function, and then another function in this named is root component movable. So this is checking that physics are enabled and we have the small movable option set just here. And really we're just doing this to make sure that we don't get any warnings or errors when we're trying to apply impulse to something which the engine would know wouldn't be able to be moved if it's set to uh, static or doesn't have the physics enabled. Then finally, we just want to store a new F vector, which is going to be the direction we want the discovered object to move. So this is an F vector that I've named forward, which is gonna be equal to this. So the component that this is on and the function get forward vector. So, so this is just going to return the way that the component is facing. And finally, the magic bit here, we're gonna say the mesh component that we've stored. We're gonna call a function on this, add impulse. We're gonna pass in the direction. So this wants to know which direction to go and at which force. So we're gonna say forward multiplied by the impulse force that we stored earlier. We then want to do something else here, which is to multiply this by the mesh component get mass. So, so this is another function getting the mass of the mesh component, which we can see here. You can allow this to be set by default. So it's gonna work out based on the scale of the object, how much uh, density and mass it thinks that this should have. I can't remember the units this is measured in, um, but Unreal's gonna use a standard default, whether that's kilograms or something. Uh, and the great thing about this is it means that we can keep our standard impulse force and this should work for anything because we'll be multiplying or taking into account how heavy the object is multiplied by the, f the force or the impulse that we're applying. So that's just what this final multiplication is to account for. Of course, if we weren't doing this, we would just need to increase the impulse force drastically to get anything to move. So uh, we're only applying 50 units of force but that's then multiplied in this case, you can see what by, I think that was something by 177. So otherwise you're gonna to have to make the impulse force essentially at least a hundred times bigger to even start moving something. Okay, with that done though, we can then return back over to the Unreal Engine, make sure you have all of that compiled and we can start testing what this is going to be doing. 
So I'll just very quickly run you through how I have the components set up as well. So in my blueprints, I've created a new folder named impulse underscore forces, uh, because this is gonna be a whole new kind of section of topics. And as I've said, we're just starting with impulse because it's pretty cool. I've then created a actor. So this is just a standard actor class. And this is all kind of just to visualize things in blueprint. I've created a cube. I've made this at 0 0.1 on all of the axes and I've added the new scene component that we've just created in C++. So this is the apply impulse component. We've got our exposed variables, so the trace distance and the impulse force. And then I've just added a rotating movement component as well. And I've left this at the default just so that I can get this rotating around to hit all of the different cubes. The final results, as you saw earlier, we have here. And the really cool thing about this is that it's super simple to come in and like I've just shown kind of amend this and you could this the idea was to put this on a component so you could very easily just throw this onto a number of different weapons change some variables to how much force you want each weapon to have how much distance it will have and things like that so we can come in we can double this which won't actually matter because of course there are only these cubes which are in range anyway but we can increase our force that we're applying so we can throw these back really far straight away and there you go I think that's a pretty cool effect and you can also see that uh, it's doing three or four different line traces at a time, or it looks like it's doing that. It's probably doing a lot more because this is on the event tick. And that's just every single time that it's finished a check and done another line trace event and returned another successful hit to the cube. So this is actually applying force to each cube multiple times. And you can also see it kind of interacting with the pillars in the background as well. And that's because the order in which we've done our logic. So I'm actually drawing the draw debug line whenever I find anything at all. If you only wanted this to be drawn if you found something valid, so a valid thing that you can apply a force to, you can of course very simply drop your draw debug line into the uh, check to see that we've got a movable actor that we're hitting. So if I compiled this now, this would only draw the debug line whenever we hit a movable cube. So that might make debugging make it a little bit more sense for you if that's all you're looking for. But I was happy to visualize it kind of showing that it was hitting anything. But of course the force is only being applied to those objects with the movable root components. So I've just compiled those changes and gone back over to the Unreal Engine. So just to demonstrate what I meant, if when I press play, you can see here that it will now only draw the debug lines if it's found the white cubes, the ones which are set to be movable, and the black pillars used just as kind of level decoration. Even though it's tracing out past that distance, they don't count as something that's worth drawing a debug line for. And of course, that was a little bit harder to tell until all of the white cubes had been moved out of the way. But you could see when there was just one remaining, even though it kept rotating, it was only drawing the one at the far back of the uh, the floor there. So with all of that done, hopefully you have enjoyed this topic. I think this kind of thing is very cool. If you have, be sure to subscribe to the channel for more content like this. Hit the notification bell so that you're told when they are uploaded to the channel. And of course, also be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed the content to let the algorithm know. And just a reminder that if you already support me on Patreon, this file is already available for you to download. You can find this through the Patreon posts. And if you'd like to get access to content like this and other projects that I provide, then do consider checking out the Patreon page. It's greatly appreciated. It helps to support the channel and allow me to keep making content like this on a weekly basis. So I'll leave that video here for now. As ever, thanks for watching and I will see you all next time.